this story, we get a lot of questions from people who, who are just sort of new to the game, and they look at gold at fifteen hundred plus dollars. They they look at silver right around thirty six now. They look at the historical chart and they gasp and they say, "I can't buy now." Um, how would you? How do you talk to people, or how do you? What's your advice around buying gold and silver now at these particular levels, or uh, at any point in time? How, how do you? How would you advise uh, people go about building a core position, say if they didn't have one? Well, I think that the, the prices will continue higher. I mean, the amount of money printing is unbelievable. I just think you have to take that initial stand in terms of buying it. I kind of use the James Turk analogy. Just keep, you know, uh, dollar averaging. Uh, we've gone up 11 years in a row. This year looks like it will be no exception. I would certainly think next year will be no exception. If we ever had a, a quantitative easing three announced, I think gold and silver would just go absolutely bonkers here and um, I just think you gotta you gotta step in there and own it that we've had these fears all the way along you know at 400 and 500 and 7 and 800 dollar gold everyone was afraid it was a, a one time thing I don't think it's a one time thing I think it's a secular thing it's going to carry on for quite a while here until we find some resolution of these problems and the resolution probably will be some form of default where people just have to expunge debts that can't be repaid. So yeah, you got to be in some asset which won't be affected by that. I, I agree. You know, I, I hear it a lot um, where people will say, well, gold's in a bubble. And, and they use price as, as the indicator to prove that. Um, bubbles are not indicated by price. They're, to me, they're, they're indicated by psychology. A bubble is a component of social psychology. Finance is sort of an afterthought. We put prices on it. Uh, I still can go to parties and find it. Almost nobody actually owns any physical gold themselves or even people who own paper representations of gold. It's still a very tiny minority, I think, in the overall investing public at this point. Um, what I do see a lot of are ads to buy all of your junk gold as if there is such a thing, you know. Yeah, I keep all my junk gold in a barrel out in, out in the garage waiting to haul it off to the local uh, <laughs> motel where they're holding a, a gold buying spree. I don't feel we're in a bubble yet because the psychology isn't there. Uh, the housing bubble had that psychology. We had hairdressers in Las Vegas with 19 homes. I don't know anybody who's a gold trader who's taken up gold trading at home or, or has become a broker or has done even owns any. Uh, what, what are your views here on gold being in a bubble? Sure. Well, you know, we've done some work on that, and uh, we kind of looked at the amount of money that had been invested in gold from uh, 2000 to uh, 2010. And I think the uh, the weighting in gold went from 2% of people's portfolios to 0.8% of people's portfolios. But if you just look at the rise in the price of gold over that time period, it accounted for by far the majority of the increase in the total investment in gold and silver, which really means very few people were making new investments in the area. And I think that is still the case. Yes, we've had some uh, early movers in gold. You know, we had some of the uh, hedge funds in the states buy gold. We recently had the Texas Pension Fund buy, buy uh, physical gold. But these are a, a few outliers here, and I don't think it's hit the uh, the mainstream to any extent whatsoever. And I might say in silver, uh, I don't really see the institutional participation in silver. Uh, when we went out marketing our silver fund in uh, October of 10, uh, we had very, very uh, weak response from the institutions which sort of told me that, you know, they haven't really taken the time to study silver and the supply and demand situation there. And I think that's all yet to come in both gold and silver, that it'll catch, uh, hit a tipping point where, where people do realize exactly what's going on and that these investments would have a lot of merit in all funds. Oh, I agree. And I, I think that particularly um, longer term funds who have a, have a bigger view, right? So these are endowments, these are pension funds, these are people who are looking out across decades. I don't know how you can look across decades at silver uh, and its fundamental supply demand uh, equation and its industrial utility and its potential monetary utility for all of its pieces. I, I see an enormous structural uh, shortfall over time. And, and that's, to me, a perfect investment opportunity and, and something that anybody with a longer view would, would uh, get involved in. My silver, personally, I have every intention of at least passing it to my children, um, but possibly my grandchildren, should I ever have any. And and it's it's something that I've, I've it, that is my Rip Van Winkle portfolio, because uh, everything I look at there says uh, there's really n not very many places for that to go, except to become far more valuable as, as we progress through time. When I look at the physical silver market, I mean, there's some stunning developments. Uh, the world supplies about 900 million ounces of silver a year. But if you simply go back to the Chinese in 05, they're a, they were an exporter of 100 million ounces. Today, they're an importer of 100 million ounces. 
That's a shift of 200 million ounces wow. from one source in a 900 million ounce market. And when you start looking at the fact that, let's go back to 05, there were no ETFs. Now we have ETFs that have 500 million ounces. Um, you had hedging, which you don't have now, although there was some uh, some action put on uh, late last year, particularly by Carlos Slim. Um, but I, I think all of the physical data we see on silver is just screaming that that uh, there's a shortage. And uh, in fact, this morning I just looked at the uh, the Silver Institute study of supply and demand for silver. And uh, I mean, I find it almost ridiculous that they always show supply equal demand, and they have a plugged-in number for investment demand. What our own analysis suggests that demand for silver is far outweighs supply, and ultimately the price has to go higher. As you've mentioned, the industrial uses, I think last year, were up something like 18 to 20 percent. The investment demand was skyrocketing. I don't know where all this silver is coming from. You have to ask yourself, well, who in 05 was getting silver that today isn't getting silver? The Chinese are buying so much and the coin sales are so high. And it just boggles the mind that, uh, that we don't, somebody hasn't come out and said, you know, they can't access silver. And that's the day I'm waiting for when, let's say, Eastman Kodak says, you know, they can't buy enough silver or there's not silver available. That'll really stun uh, the silver market. Hmm. So I really want to wade into um, uh, the CFTC and all of that in just a second. But I, I remember reading that your silver fund had bought a quite a, 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 an amount of silver. I think it was several million ounces. I forget the number. And that it took a number of months uh, to actually receive it. Is that, is that true? Yes. Uh, when we started the fund, we had to go into the market and buy 15 million ounces of silver, which is not a lot in a 900 million ounce market. Uh, the stunning thing is it took about uh, two and a half months to receive that silver. And uh, when we looked at the bars, we'd seen some of that silver we ultimately purchased was manufactured after we purchased it. In other words, it was manufactured in November and we bought it in October. So it just told me there, there's no silver lying around to be delivered against contracts. It's uh, And when you look at the COMEX inventories, which I think the dealer inventories are something like uh, 28 or 29 million ounces, I mean, that's that's $1.2 billion. I mean, that is nothing for the, that any one of 500 institutions could buy, and there would be no COMEX silver. So, I mean, the whole takedown of silver, the manipulation of silver that's been uh, suggested in the lawsuits, I think, uh, stands a good chance of uh, proving to be the case. The raid that took place on May 1st was a joke. We're just in the process of analyzing it now, and there was no way that the speculators on the long side could maintain their position when you wake up on a Monday morning and you're already down six bucks an ounce, which basically would have gotten rid of all your margin already, and then they bang on four subsequent margin rate increases. It was was a perfectly orchestrated raid by the people who were short, but but I think it's, it indicates that uh, there was a real physical problem in the silver market, and I expect that to manifest itself as we move into the latter part of this year. Yeah, I watched that one in real time. Uh, I was up late that night on Sunday, and, and I saw that huge plunge. It actually recovered a bit of that plunge. But the plunge started, I think the only markets open at that point were maybe Hong Kong or maybe Sydney, and, and they're tiny. So so the raid started in, in the very thinly traded Globex market. And, and to me, it's kind of like um, the analogy would be the price of beef plummets in Hawaii uh, one night, and the next morning all of Oklahoma wokes up and finds out that their beef is worth 20% less. It, it just didn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, is that what you're seeing there? Well, just imagine the margin calls. You know, you drop five or six bucks like that. I mean, most people against a $48 contract probably only add up with five or six bucks of, of collateral. So you have to double it overnight, and then they bang out the four margin rate increases. And by the time it was all over, I mean, you're down uh, $15 off the high. Just imagine the flow of money needed to maintain your position. And, of course, now we see the evidence of what happened. I think the uh, the SLV lost 50 million physical ounces. Um, the specs were forced to cover the shorts. Uh, sorry, the specs were forced to liquidate, and, and the commercials who were short the whole time were able to buy back a lot of uh, paper silver in the process and, and book profits. But it's so cl- it's such a classic setup in the silver market to force the uh, speculators to cover. And I mean, yes, they won that little battle, but I'm certainly. Uh, 
don't think they're going to win the war. And and your view then is that somehow this is um, uh, we've got the commercials, we've got the big banks. I presume you mean the bullion banks in this case, uh, the the players. If you don't want to name names, that's fine. But but your your view is that they have um, uh, some. Uh, outsized abilities to influence this market, and, and let's call it what it is, it's manipulate the market in order to extract economic advantage for themselves. Are, are they doing this simply because this is a bear raid um, strategy they know how to pull off and it's been successful and they make money at it? Or are they doing this to hold prices down? Or is it both? Or What's your view on this then? Well, I think, Chris, when you realize how much money these shorts were losing, I mean, we had silver rally from $18 to $50, or $49.50, I mean, the losses would have been monumental. Um, they were being forced to deal with the short position. Uh, it was a perfect night for raids because, as you mentioned, China was closed that day. The U.K. was closed. Nobody was really up when, when this decline took place. And I gather it took place on very, very few contracts. So it's a typical tactic in the precious metals market. We've seen it all along in gold. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many raids we've seen from the gold price over the last 11 years, but they occur with great regularity. Uh, but ultimately, they fail. And um, again, I'm, I refer to James Turk, and you know he, he describes the gold prices. It's a measured retreat by uh, the central banks and, and the bullion shortage. They just know that there's a shortage of physical gold. And I always like to use the analogy. Imagine if the price, imagine if in the world everything was the same today, save one thing. Let's say the silver price was still $5. Imagine the amount of money that is going into silver today and how much silver you'd buy at $5. I mean, you'd be buying 10 times more than you would have imagined. But the supply was relatively the same. So they have to let the price go up to decrease the physicalness of the market that the money wanting to go in can buy fewer and fewer ounces as the price goes up. Well, certainly you mentioned uh, increased Chinese demand, also India, an important source of demand. And uh, this is just economics 101. Uh, you know, if the if you hold the price down, demand will go up. And, and so I, I am sensitive to the idea that, that there are um, – uh, that central banks have long been interested in the price of gold and, and politicians too. They, they like it to stay relatively tame, like they like inflation to stay relatively tame because a higher raising, spiking signal from gold it says something. And it says something, I think, cast aspersions on their policy decisions and other things. So, and we know this, we know that from the London gold pool in 69 and, and Ruben's strong dollar policy and all kinds of things that, that, that this has been a, one of many things that the banks look at. Um, so I, I know they look at it and I, I'm sure they don't uh, cry many tears uh, when price of gold is held in check. But the flip side to that is that then we have more demand than we would otherwise have. And part of that process then involves, I think, a hemorrhaging of the gold and silver away from those places of, of low prices and towards the people who want to buy it. Um, are you seeing in, it change you know, patterns of flows in, in the overall global precious metals market? I mean, grossly speaking, is this is it leaking from west to east? Well, I don't think there's any doubt about it. As people assess the economic policies throughout the world, they realize <laughs> the fee of currency is just paper. The demand for um, physical silver and gold is, of course, strongest in India and China. I think, as you noted, the, the interest in gold and silver in uh, developed countries is not nearly the same as it is in uh, the less developed countries. So I think those trends are going to continue when the developed countries catch on, which might start happening pretty quickly here with the recent data we've seen, which basically show that we're falling off a cliff. And um, one of the things I challenge investors with these days is if you don't know what's going to happen on July 1st when QE2 ends, are we all just like a herd of lemmings going over a cliff here? Because there better be a QE3 or you're going to have some economic crisis. And, of course, economic crises are not good for banks and my ultimate a view of what happened to gold and silver is people decide to take their money out of the banks. And there's only one place to go. And, you know, we've seen this happen in various countries that run into trouble. We hear about, you know, money flowing out of Greek banks and why wouldn't it? And, you know, the next one is money was flowing out of Portuguese banks. And sooner or later, instead of just moving from bank A to bank B, people might start moving from bank A, B, and C to precious metals, which I think is is what ultimately will happen here and provide this huge uh, supernova for gold.